Hello and welcome to this Mastering the Machine webinar for March the 5th, 2021. This is a production of the Automation Academy and today's guest is Lucas Wetton, who is actually a student of mine doing a controls project. He is the Vice President of Project Development for the PFC Group, which is a dust collection company manufacturer of dust collection systems. So he'll be telling us about dust collection systems and the project that he has building a control system for these. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Anyway, yeah, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hopefully everybody sees the splash screen and I do a little intro here first. Uh, of course, today is March the 5th, which is uh, Actually, tornado anniversary. So happy tornado anniversary to everyone. Um, as a matter of fact, March 3rd last year was the tornado that came through Nashville and Lebanon, Tennessee. And uh, uh, by the way, Vlad, you're the only other participant at this moment, but people usually drop in and out. I have to control all the stuff myself, which is hard. Uh, Dave and Vlad swap off. And that's a good idea. I, I, that's I, why I love the co-host. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. And and I, I've had uh, Doug Allward on here a couple of times. He's a good co-host and he kind of can manage some of that. But uh, but anyway, yes, this is the anniversary of my tornado or very close to it. Um, it was March 3rd last year. And these pictures were probably taken uh, almost to the day, right? March the 5th. So um, that is the outside and this was the inside. So I had a pretty cool little setup for training. Um, funny thing about this setup, you know, Lucas uh, has taken training from me here in my new place and it's just an old house, right? But my old place, I set this thing up with the idea that I was gonna do hands-on training for people. And as people showed up and, and we started trying to do it, I realized, you know, you're not gonna crowd uh, six people around uh, you know, something like this and try to have a class. It just doesn't work. So Automation NTH is one of my customers. They have a thing called Automation Univer NTH University and they send people over and I can only put two people on here at once. And they'd program this thing and they know we're near got done with it, you know, writing the full program. But I, I did two or three classes with it, about one per year and realized, you know, it's cool, it was fun, but that is not, uh, going to be a, a trainer, right? So everybody should have their own little trainers or something. That's the way to do it because there's just, you can't fit everybody in there. But anyway, that, that is, the, this is the anniversary of that. So happy tornado anniversary, everybody. This is for Phil. I noticed Phil just joined. Hello, Phil. Uh, so, uh, and I usually explain what is mastering the machine. When I started these webinars, uh, they were just open webinars and I, I've done one from a plant in Miami and I've, I've had guests on a few and things like that. And I've even just done programming simulation on some, but uh, then I changed it uh, uh, this year to titling it Mastering the Machine, which is named after a document I put out in 2013 that's something called a lead magnet. So what people do is they download that and you get their email in, in exchange and then you spam the heck out of them. I don't, I don't do that. I'm not very good at spamming because I, I, I'm I not proactive on sending my uh, emails out, right? Uh, but that is the idea behind those. You get people's email address and then you tell them about what you're doing and maybe they sign up for your, you know, website or whatever your pitch is. Now, um, Vlad would know about that. He's got a big website with lots of members and people come in and take his classes and, and that kind of thing. Uh, he does a lot of recorded videos. So anyway, that's what this is all about. And then one of the people on here, uh, Phil, I noticed that you're on here, uh, have asked me some of the feedback. Uh, one guy in particular, a guy named Seven, Seven Matthew, mentioned that uh, really they weren't there for the PLC programming at all. Uh, you know, they joined because they wanted to learn more about systems integration and machine building, which is my background. So they were kind of wanting personal lessons for me. And I was like, oh, well, okay, whatever people want, uh, that's what we'll do. And then it's migrated into this. And so today, uh, my guest is uh, Lucas Wetton. And Lucas, 
uh, is the VP of, let me see, product development for a company called Profab China PFC. And he's also, um, I don't know what his other title, he'll tell you about that one, but he's also uh, part of a big group here that does a lot of fabrication uh, in, in the US. So I, I don't know what that is, maybe like a, almost a trade organization or something. And I'll let Lucas uh, tell you what those are, but that's on his LinkedIn profile also. So um, where I met Lucas is Lucas actually uh, kind of out of the blue and he can tell you how he found my name. I was probably online. But he said, uh, you know, I'm interested in taking one of your PLC classes. So I said, okay, well, uh, what brand? And he said, well, not 100% sure, but, you know, Alan Bradley, probably something like that. We'll have to talk about it. So we started talking about it. And what it got into was, again, my last three classes here have not been PLC classes. They've been a little bit of everything classes, right? Uh, Lucas is doing something pretty amazing. His current project is a control system for dust collection system, which Lucas knows all about the dust collection part and his father started the company and there's a lot of metal forming and I respect anybody who does that because I've done it and cut my hands up while doing it. I, I have all kind of good metal forming and bending equipment still and shears and I know about the left-handed shears and the right-handed shears, the center cutter shears and that's hard work. Uh, but anyway, so th they're this company and they were located in Kentucky and then now they're in, uh, in China. And actually Lucas was in uh, Wuhan. You notice that it says Luke Wuhan up there when COVID hit. So he was actually there in China, which is amazing. Maybe he'll tell you something about that too. Um, and I think speaks a little bit of Chinese, which is pretty cool too. But anyway, he's building uh, from scratch a, a full dust collection system which includes things like a hundred horsepower drive and a five horsepower drive and a three horsepower drive and all the associated stuff. And what it's turned into is that it's the associated stuff and how are you going to draw it and how are you going to, how are you going to do all that? So we've had a lot of good discussions. He's been to my facility here in person. And we of course also do things by zoom, et cetera. And uh, with that, I am going to turn the controls over to Lucas. Let me see how this works. So stop share. You got to kind of get in between. Hello, everybody. And uh, I will, I believe all you have to do is hit share screen, Lucas. All right. Thank you, Frank. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope uh, you guys are all doing well. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I do. Good deal. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. And uh, you guys let me know if you're seeing, I've got a PowerPoint pulled up. Can you see that? Yep, I do. Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. Um, I don't know if the little video sidebar is showing up on your screen or just the PowerPoint. I didn't know if it was mirroring my screen exactly. Is that not in the way? Just the PowerPoint. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll give you guys the, the kind of the 30,000 foot uh, view of what I'm doing. Talk a little bit about our company um, and what my job is. And then um, sort of talk a little bit more about my travels or my journey over the last <laughs> three or four months on this uh, engineering uh, electrical controls project. So yeah, I, re I initially reached out to Frank because we, uh, we got a project that involved replacing a dust collection system and our customer, uh, they had a fire in their existing equipment. And so with the replacement dust collector, they wanted all the bells and whistles. And uh, I'll, I'll explain why that makes a big difference. Um, so instead of uh, outsourcing the controls, once again, I decided that I thought I could take it on um, and try and figure this out. Uh, because I know my equipment pretty well, um, even though I don't have an electrical background. And uh, I will say this right now, I can assure everyone who's here or whoever listens to this that I know the least about electrical engineering and wiring and automation than anybody else who's uh, with us here. So <laughs> you'll have to forgive me. But um, anyway, I decided to tackle this project and I talked to Frank and um, it's, it's been a very interesting project. Uh, I've learned a lot, but it's, it's been a lot of fun. 
Um, and so what we do, we build uh, dust collectors. Um, let me see. Uh, well, let, let me actually, I'm just going to follow this slideshow and uh, ignore the Chinese here. Um, this is designed for our Asia market, but this is, I think, our best uh, slideshow. So I was going to use this. My dad, Mark, started the, uh, the prod company uh, back in 1985. Um, just as a general fabrication. Um, so we were building all kinds of process equipment or just sometimes structural equipment, uh, whatever our customers needed. Um, in 1997, we started a second company um, here in Kentucky that is Amtec. And uh, that company is a dedicated dust collector manufacturer. Um, in 2014, we decided to establish a third company in China. Um, we had been doing work for a customer of ours, a big uh, automotive parts manufacturer, Federal Mogul. Um, we had done work for them uh, from 2008 to 2013 in Wuhan and a few other places in China. And the amount of work they were giving us justified setting up a new company. Um, and so that is where I came into the picture. and. From 2014 to 2018, I spent most of my time living in China, uh, in Wuhan, helping get this new company off the ground. Um, and so what, what we did with this new company um, is we took our business model that we had established in 97 with Amtec and uh, adapted it, modified it, I would say upgraded it for the Asian uh, Chinese domestic market. Um, and so we modified the product that we had developed over the prior 20 years um, to try and upgrade it, streamline it, and, uh, you know, add a little, little few features that we thought made it uh, a more attractive product. Um, so dust collectors, generally speaking, um, if you spend any time in essentially any factory in a country where there are emissions protocols, you will almost certainly see a dust collector. Um, any kind of industrial process, sawing, cutting, burning, drilling, uh, welding, um, even just conveying uh, for food products generates a lot of dust. And besides the, you know, the, the importance of keeping your facility clean, uh, depending on the nature of the dust that's being generated, there's a serious safety issue. Um, there are uh, some pretty famous stories. Uh, I, I think it was uh, Imperial Sugar. Or I, I forget the name of the plant back in uh, the 70s or 80s before this was really being pushed um, in a sugar facility where sugar dust was so dense in the air that um, a spark from a uh, conveyor ignited the facility and, and it exploded. Several people were killed. So dust collection is a pretty important part of essentially any factory's operations and and, and process control. Um, so up until I would say about 40, 40, 50 years ago, essentially there was really only one type of equipment that people would use in factories and those are bag houses, um, which the uh, Chinese there at the top of the screen says bag houses, but <laughs> that's, that's what this picture is. I, this is actually from the original patent drawing from the early 20th century. And essentially what you have is you have a box with filters and you're sucking air in, the filters trap the dust, and then the clean air comes out through the other side of the filter. It's a really simple process, mechanically speaking. Um, as time went on, bag houses have become more advanced. So you have features like shaking, pulsing, uh, to remove the dust that accumulates around the bags or the filters, uh, and that prolongs life uh, increases their effectiveness. Um, but what you see in the 1980s and 90s is this revolution um, where people started using cartridge filters. Um, and so cartridge collectors are essentially bag houses, but on a much smaller platform. Um, so you can see there on the far right of the side of the screen, that's a cartridge filter. And instead of a bag or a, a bag house filter that's a long tube, sometimes 20 feet long, usually like five or six inches in diameter, um, you can get the same amount of filter surface area by pleating the filter and having a more compact uh, filtration system. Um, 
in addition to that, you know, there are some other designs and issues that come with it. And where we saw a place in the market was typical cartridge collectors, and I'm not going to uh, focus on any of our competitors, if you will, um, but a lot of dust collector uh, companies don't put a lot of effort into designing their equipment optimally. Um, why? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that at least one particular company, they're in the business of actually selling filters. Um, and so you think your HP printer, um, they sell those things at near cost because the money's not in the printer, it's in the ink. And uh, this kind of collector system, they could care less about how effective it is because they're in the business of selling filters. Um, and so there's probably an advantage to them if it's not an optimally designed product. Um, and so what you see are issues with bridging. Um, you see these filters are run horizontally and so dust can get inside there and even with the pulsing that gets stuck. And, and so anyway, we saw a problem with the product and uh, because we're not in the business of selling filters, um, we decided that we would try and design a different sort of system. So our product is a vertical cartridge collector. Um, so instead of the cartridges being aligned horizontally, they are aligned vertically. Um, so it actually increases the lifespan of the filters. It allows for pulsing to work more effectively. Um, and, and there's a little video I'll show you in a second that's a little more clear about what, what this does. But your clean air comes in from the top. Um, so we actually utilize gravity to uh, sort of catch the dust or propel it towards the bottom of the collector. Um, but then also when we pulse these filters, which we do by uh, inserting or uh, releasing a jet stream of air from a solenoid valve, as it knocks the dust off, it falls to the sides. Um, let me jump here. Going back to, I, I guess this is, I'll just spend a second on this slide talking about the advantages, because a, a lot of people still are cautious about trying new products, uh, which is fair. Um, there are a lot of advantages for cartridge collectors over bag houses. To be honest with you, we build both because sometimes your customers just want what they want and you need to keep your customer happy, but there's a huge uh, cost and savings advantage to a cartridge collector. They're way, way smaller. Um, this is a size comparison of two equivalently sized systems. Um, so the initial cost can be much smaller, um, but also the operating costs because you're just dealing with a smaller piece of equipment. Um, so I can get this video to work. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so this is a, one of our products. So you can see here, these are the filters. Um, I'll pause it for a second. These pieces right here, these are not filters, although they look they're the same color. This is actually the clean air duct. Um, and these filters sit on top of this duct. And you can see here to the side, these are the solenoid valves. And this clean air duct is open on this end to where the fan is. And the fan will mount actually in the duct sometimes. It's a bigger system. We have a, a standalone fan. Um, but what happens is you've got your dust that comes in through the inlet of the collector. And uh, it attaches to these filters because the air is being pulled through and out this clean air duct at the bottom. And across intervals or either with a, you know, a differential pressure rating, we will trigger a pulse that will remove the dust um, and then the cycle repeats. Uh, and so that's, that's the basics of our system. Um, this is something I like to show our customers because uh, to me, it's pretty powerful uh, evidence. This is the actual pulsing in action. And you can see with that vertical alignment, it's great because the dust goes straight down. Um, and so this is with one of the doors open on our collectors. Uh, so you can see that process in action. Um, let me see. Uh, that's more technical stuff. That's promo stuff. Um, I, so as I mentioned, we do build bag houses. This is a bag house that we built uh, and installed in, um, I think this one was in Mexico City. Um, so this is, you know, uh, something we still do for our customers, but obviously it's not our main product line. Um, 
when we approach a customer, um, of course, we we have to provide a turnkey solution. Um, so in addition to the drawings and the design and the actual equipment, um, we have to do the electrical products. Um, this is another uh, one of our systems. This is in Luoyang, China. Um, this was at a foundry. Uh, you can see here, that's the collector itself. Um, sometimes we partner it with a cyclone um, to remove some of the heavy particulate as it's coming in. Um, this is another picture of one of our products. This is a smaller unit, uh, but you'll see there, there's the clean air coming out to the fan, um, all the incoming duct work, and that's the actual package. Um, I'll note actually for our purposes, these are the controls for that system. Um, and they're pretty doggone simple. Um, I mentioned that this project we're doing here in the States right now, our customer wanted all the bells and whistles. We have never had a, an electrical engineering or electrical design component of our business because 90% of the time, um, our customers have a simple system like this where effectively the only mechanical components that have to be controlled are the fan and the pulse valves. And the fan can pretty easily be controlled with just a, a motor starter. Um, if it's a big fan, you know, soft start, that, that whole business. And then the pulse valves um, can be controlled by uh, ready plug and play pulse controls. So it's, it's a super simple setup 90% of the time. Um, when our customers do want a more complex installation, however, uh, we have to start dealing with things like rotary valves, um, or if there are screw conveyors, um, you know, there, there's any number of things that we might add to the system. Um, I'm just kind of breezing through here. If anybody sees something that catches their interest, let me know. These are some pictures from our uh, company in uh, Kentucky, Amtec. You can see it's a very similar product. Um, they're, uh, they're essentially the same product uh, with some, some minor differences. Um, let's see, I think that's mo most of what I had there. I'm gonna see, let me share my screen again. Can you guys see that? Yep. So, uh, <laughs> yep. So basically, uh, because our customer wanted all these upgrades, if you will, um, I decided to try and tackle this. And uh, some of the things that we had to consider, um, they wanted to have uh, uh, control over the speed of the fan. Um, sometimes you can link it to, uh, the actual the differential pressure which measures how basically how dirty the filters are and control the fan accordingly so when it, they're dirtier the fan runs uh, at a higher rate when they're not it can run at a slower rate um, other issues we had uh, fire safety equipment um, so sensing if there's smoke temperature changes um, the pulsing sequence since we were going to go with the controls instead of using the pulse control um, we need a, a control that would handle the pulsing as well. Um, and then, you know, there are other various little features that we've given them. Um, but basically, I came to Frank and said, hey, here's, here's what I've got. This is what I'm trying to do. I know my equipment, and I've got a decent idea of what I need to do. But um, I have never, uh, I've never done any electrical work before. Um, I've not done any programming, coding. Um, I've, I've done some maybe HTML and some computer programming, um, but nothing on ladder logic. Uh, and also I've never really done much wiring. And so Frank very graciously agreed to help me tackle this. So what we did was we started, I guess, with the PLC platform. Um, and I knew that I needed an Allen Bradley uh, with some pretty rough estimations on inputs and outputs and capability, uh, we ultimately settled on the MicroLogix platform. And from there, it was a matter of selecting equipment, essentially. Um, so Automation Direct is my new best friend. Um, I've been uh, on that website, selecting stuff, identifying components, and using them for customer service uh, help with products. And so 
slowly built my components list. And then after that, I began the long and still not quite finished process of drawing up my, my cabinet and the wiring. Um, and so uh, big, big caution, la uh, caution statement, uh, warning label I'm gonna put on this. My cabinet is still being wired and this isn't in the field yet. So uh, <laughs> we'll see how this all turns out. But uh, this is a drawing that I used for myself because I, I'm a visual person and uh, this is what I needed. I laid out the cabinet here in AutoCAD and uh, I placed all of my components, tried to make sure I had enough space. Um, and then I went back through after the fact and tried to draw in all the wires that I thought that I might need. Um, and I didn't get completely done with this. You'll see down here, I've got the safety uh, stuff. I've got that there, but I didn't draw in the wiring. Sort of updating my electrical schematics. Um, so it's, it's been a, a challenge for sure. Um, and I'm still working through it, but uh, there, there have been a few interesting things that uh, from my perspective surprised me that for those of you who do a lot of electrical work or automation, um, you guys I'm sure are aware of, um, I did not realize how many extra components I needed to deal with on the VFDs for this fan. Um, and that was one thing I, I, I was commiserating with Frank yesterday on the phone um, so I started out with this big VFD down here. It's a 100 horsepower fan motor. And so 100 horsepower VFD. And one of the complications that we have with our products is when there is a fire or uh, there's a, uh, an alarm or somebody hits the e-stop, you need to stop the fan pretty quickly. Uh, because if there's a fire, obviously, oxygen feeds a fire. And if a fan's pulling air through the system, um, you're just only, you're going to exacerbate the problem. So I needed to figure out, you know, stopping the fan pretty quickly. Well, um, I realized pretty soon that I needed a braking unit with the resistor. So I, I was working with Automation Direct and um, they got me what I needed. And uh, a couple nights ago, I was just uh, browsing through it's right here, the, the Durapulse manual. And uh, I realized the schematic showed two uh, breaking units. So I called them back up and uh, the technician confirmed, yeah, actually there are two. So and there goes another $1,200 that I didn't anticipate spending. Um, but, you know, that's that's just part of the process. And so, you know, it's it's been really interesting to me figuring out how all these components interface with one another. Um, but uh, that's that's where we're at. So I, I guess what I'd like to do maybe is uh, open up the floor to you guys. I am very happy to answer questions about uh, my journey through this uh, programming and building my cabinet um, or talk about my business uh, in China, what it was like living in Wuhan or uh, dust collection in general. I'm, I'm, I'd love to talk about whatever you guys would like to hear about. So behind the scenes, uh... Uh, Vlad and I have been uh, talking kind of back and forth. So he asked, uh, uh, he said, uh, why, why did, did you decide on Automation Direct? And of course, now I'll, I'll take uh, credit for or, or the uh, punishment for suggesting that. Um, here's my background. So I worked for the Allen Bradley distributor. I think Vlad did at some point too. I, I don't remember. But uh, so Alan Bradley makes some really good stuff, but it's super duper expensive. Um, they are paying for the overhead of the engineers that are there to support you. That's part of what they do. I was a specialist at Alan Bradley uh, in the early 90s. So they were forced to keep us there as, as product support. So that's part of what you're paying for. And just Alan Bradley's expensive. So that's why we wouldn't, for instance, choose Alan Bradley drives. Automation Direct, uh, where I used to use their drives, they sold Hitachi drives at one point, and I used to use a, quite a few of the Hitachis. Um, I think the ones you've got, Lucas, are they Durapulse? What are yes, they? they are. The okay. GS3, GS3 series. Yeah, so I'm not sure who the ultimate maker of Durapulse is, 
But I looked at all the specs and I've been to the Automation Direct uh, facility. I know Tim Homan, who is the guy who started PLC Direct in the 90s. I have a really cool picture of myself in his office. His office is the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. It would blow your mind. It's all the walls are black with stars and he's got a, a great big console where it looks just like a, you know, a Starship control place. It, very cool. But that, that place, my experience, I used to even use their PLCs. I was very fortunate. A local plant was TRW Coyo. If you recognize the Coyo name, that's uh, Automation Direct's PLCs. They were Japanese made and they used to make the somatics. They made uh, PLCs for GE. They made Texas Instruments PLCs. So they go way back. Uh, they use some pretty high quality stuff. Um, so for the trainers that you see behind me, I use some of their stuff, you know, e-stops and uh, push buttons, things like that. Inexpensive, great online catalog, right? I, I'd say Lucas will probably verify that one. You can just find everything about all the products, all the online catalogs. The downside, they will not come to your facility. They're not going to help you in person. But if you have a technical question, they literally have a giant circular building with catwalks and equipment on the walls and they walk up to that equipment and they actually solve the problem there on the equipment for you if you have technical problems so i used to use this is in the 90s but i used to use a lot of automation direct equipment um, at that time you didn't have control logics you didn't have tag based stuff i have never used the productivity 3000 and the tag based stuff it looks great it's got to be less than half the cost of control logic. So I'm eager to try it uh, at the same time. Now, is it something I would spec for a, for a giant plant that is spec on Allen Bradley? No, <laughs> right? I mean, people who are spec on Allen Bradley and Siemens are spec for a reason. But, you know, like Lucas, I had never had a problem specking uh, their equipment. It's quality equipment. I've had stuff that's been running for 15 years straight in plants. Um, never had a problem with their quality and they stand behind their work. So uh, I always feel like I have to defend automation direct because it's inexpensive, you know, uh, I'll, I'll jump in there real quick. I, and, and I apologize. I, with the screen share feature, I, I can't seem to pull up the chat. So Frank, you may have to monitor that for me in case there are other questions, but um, I'll, I'll say from my perspective, um, two big things that made a huge difference for me is, that on their website, uh, easily accessible data, documents, uh, drawings. Um, so I, you know, my AutoCAD is my world. And when I'm designing something, if I can get the two scale AutoCAD drawings and they offer the 3D, 2D, uh, step, I just, uh, SolidWorks files for everything um, down to the individual terminal blocks, that, that was huge for me. The second thing is uh, I have been blown away by their customer service. And before I actually even placed my first order, I called them probably a dozen times and spoke to, I, I guess, probably a dozen different tech reps um, asking them questions about uh, how should I mount this or what about the wiring on this? And that was really impressive to me that a company would dedicate that level of customer support to somebody who's not even a paying customer. Um, and that, that was pretty impressive to me. Um, and I've, I've found their, their help to be pretty impressive. Uh, I, I've, re I've really been happy. Yeah. And I gotta, I gotta say, Lucas, your drawings are pretty awesome. Uh, we've, we've been through a lot of discussions on some of the details, the, the numbering systems. There are so many different ways that people number things kind of, and we've kind of settled on this hybrid thing. It's basically page number, line number based stuff. Uh, and, and I think he's still working on that, but this is his first set of electrical drawings. And the first time when we were sitting in, in my office here and we started doing training, he pulled out this iPad with a colored, it's like a graph paper uh, thing. And he started drawing on there and he was doing basic, almost full CAD on this, on this little, and, and I was like, man, where can I get that program? Because it looks like it's just an app or something running on your iPad. And he said, well, it's only available on an iPad. And I'm like, man, everything I've got's a PC, but he's a, he's pretty darn good at drawing. And these drawings are quite professional uh, for somebody. This is his first set of electrical drawings. And you can kind of see from a distance here. Um, 
still discussing some of the numbering systems, but he's not using AutoCAD electrical here, right? He's using regular AutoCAD. So yes, being able to grab those files, uh, physically sign a, a size everything. The other thing about Automation Direct, it's a one-stop shop. You know, if you go to uh, Alan Bradley, you're not going to get everything. You're going to, you know, they don't make enclosures, for instance. So you're, you're going to have to buy your Hoffman or your uh, Rital. Those are usually the big names. I think uh, they use Wigman, I believe, at, at uh, Automation Direct. And all the enclosures are there. And everything's next day. It's next day shipment, which is huge. Um, so, yeah, he's gotten, I think, all the electrical components from their transformers and, uh you know, disconnects and disconnects are all major brands. Are, are they Cutler Hammer or do you know? I don't remember who made the disconnects. Uh, you know, I can't remember myself right now. Uh, the main disconnect, uh, all I remember is that it has photovoltaic on it. Does it, is it Eaton maybe? They may be Eaton. Uh, the, circuit, the circuit breakers are all Eaton. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's stuff, and you, sometimes you even have a choice. Uh, they sometimes have products from different makers, but yeah, that's where most of this stuff came from. Uh, pretty standard stuff, really, but but I hear you. I mean, it, it's like you go to normal plants and everything's Allen Bradley or Siemens or from your local distributor, right? Whoever that is. And if you're pinned to your Allen Bradley distributor, um, you know, that's geographically located. So, so uh here it's Stuart Irby. It's your only choice. I think he's in Kentucky, so he actually has a different distributor. You have, uh, is it Rec not Rexel? Who is it? Uh, CED. CED. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's the one thing they, I, they don't they don't overlap. <laughs> uh, I will. I'll show you this if you're interested. So this has been my workstation at our shop, um, and and this has been a whole process it, itself. Uh, <laughs> This is what I've been doing at home. Uh, Frank was gracious enough to uh, give me a, a small enclosure so that I could lug, lug my stuff around while I was wiring. I promise you, this is not what the cabinet looks like. Uh, this is uh, when I was just doing the initial setup and some of the programming. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a process, but uh, it, it was convenient for me starting out um, to put everything right there next to each other and mess around with the wiring. Um, but, uh, so, you know, this is a whole nother world for me, um, building the cabinet and things as simple as figuring out the best way of mounting and recognizing that once I put this sub panel in, um, I've got to figure out, you know, Hey, what if I've got to take these things off and welding studs and, um, you know, cutting the holes, making sure everything fits. And so, you know, this is, uh, from a, about a week ago, I don't have a more updated picture, but um, lining things up, making sure everything fits. Uh, and that's, that's been an you interesting. You don't actually day. see your, we see the, just the CAD drawing still. Are you showing? Oh, the graph? uh, yes. Let me, you may be on a different screen, drag it from the other screen in front of this screen. You may get it. That's what I have to do. Zoom's tough, man. Uh, how about that? Can you see that now? No, just your drawing still. How about that? Yeah, there you go. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me back up. So yeah, this is this is my little workstation that I set up and I uh, got a small uh, little uh, volt, voltage generator so that I could hook up individual components and, you know, test them. You know, I plug up the stack light and see what I needed to do there. Uh, this is what I was talking about, my, uh, my mess. Uh, I saw that, yeah. But, uh, you know, that's that's part of what I had to do was just put things together and start pulling wires across. And, um, you know, it's funny. I, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this, but uh, troubleshooting. I, I can't I can't begin to calculate the number of hours I've sat, you know, trying to change my code, figure out why isn't this working. And then I realize I daisy chain to, uh, you know, an, an input that, you know, is not a relay or whatever. Um, but. <laughs> Anyway, no, I, so yeah, I've been in through the process of mounting things and just lining things up. And so where I'm at right now is, uh, this is again from a little while ago, but uh, putting all those studs on and lining things up, figuring out the best practices for where to locate things. 
Looks cool. Um, so yeah, one of the things that's kind of unique, you see these relays down here, uh, his, his, um, his uh, solenoids are AC solenoids. And, and I guess this is a standard that they use and they pull quite a bit of current. So rather than firing them directly from the, uh, the PLC, we use these relays and we talked about the advantage of solid state versus um, you know, uh, contact type relays. And of course there's lifetime issues there's all kinds of things. So he's using these little, I don't know if those are triac uh, kind of solid state relays or exactly what those are, but they're in banks. Uh, he fires two of the valves at a time. And that's the stuff that blows the dust off, off of things, I guess, blows dust around in the system. And then he's got a giant drive over here on the right side that is not in there yet. And of course, that's probably one of the last things you want to put in because it makes everything very, very heavy. Uh, you know, so uh, right now he can probably still lift his uh, backplane and, and he's going to get to a point where if you have to pick that backplane up, you may be doing it by the drive. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've had those before where you, you literally grab the drive and the backplane goes with it. I don't think this is going to be that. I think you'll, you'll have. Yeah, that, uh, that GS3 4100, I think is the part number. It's, uh, it weighs 172 pounds. It's a big old boy. Yeah. And then he just put some uh, big braking resistors and, and I didn't know this either. He's been doing all this specking himself, but he bought one set of braking resistors. And then when he dug into the documentation, it said, well, you need two. And so he called the guys up and said, do I really need two? And they said, well, it depends on whether you really want to, you know, run the risk of burning the drive up when you stop the fan and that kind of thing. And typically, you know, a fan, a fan like that would probably take several minutes to stop, but they have a kind of a safety issue. If they, what they're doing here, that's very, it's kind of unique. We kind of came up with a control scheme ourselves. Instead of having a contactor that removes, I mean, there's a contactor that removes power, but his e-stop basically is going to kill the power to the drive, but with a stop. So back in the, uh, Back in the 90s, when you had to stop a servo or something, you didn't want to stop it immediately, right? You wanted to uh, issue the stop command, make sure that it was stopped, and then remove the power from everything. And so here, uh, and this was before the dual channel relays that are, are common now. So uh, Lucas has a, a kind of a hybrid system where it is a dual channel uh, you know, e-stop, but it's into a kind of a single channel relay with a big contactor. It pulls power, but he issues the stop command and uses the braking resistors to make sure the fan comes to a stop pretty quickly. I don't know. This is not for personnel safety. Uh, you would have to tool to remove all the covers anyway. Uh, but for some reason, he's going the extra mile and saying, we want to stop that fan as, as fast as possible. So that's what the braking resistors are for. Because if people hit the e-stop, you're still going to have control of everything, but you're going to drop uh, 480 to the drives. Uh, but there is no other real safety, right? There's not, uh, there, there's nothing that moves that would grab you other than if you got into the fan, which you would have to take a lot of covers and things off, obviously, to get into the fan. So I don't, I don't think that's a safety hazard, but it, he is going the extra mile here with that big contactor and e-stop circuit. So, um I, I'd be happy. I, I don't know if there are any questions in the in the chat or if anybody does have any questions, I'd be happy to talk about, uh, you know, anything else about our, our experience doing business overseas or, um, you know, the kind of work we've done uh, in China. Looks like Phil had a couple of questions, but if I may, on the technical side, really quickly, I'm curious about the protocol that you use to control the speed of those drives. Is that just an analog signal going from the MicroLogics, or is there, um, like, can you connect over RS-232 to these drives? Like, what's the, what did you decide to use? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm just using, I actually, that was one thing that I had to consider. So I've got three drives, uh, the big one for the fan, um, and then these two small ones are for a rotary valve and a screw conveyor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually, considered controlling the uh, screw conveyor and the rotary valve uh, dynamically from the PLC. 
Um, but the, there's a problem. Um, one, I only had the two outputs that I had available. Um, and I did not want to change the rotary valve speed without changing the screw conveyor speed because then you've got blockages and they're moving at different rates. So when I do the setup, I'm just going to program these uh, at the rate that I need them. And then I'm just going to do a start stop for the conveyor and the airlock. On the fan, um, I am going to control that with the analog signal from the PLC. And I am going to tie that to the differential pressure. Um, it's not mounted here, but right there, I'm, I have a pressure differential transducer. Um, it's from Dwyer Products. And so it'll have two compressed air lines, or not compressed air lines, two air hoses that connect to the clean and the dirty sides of the collector. And they measure the difference in pressure between the two, um, coming back to that whole, you know, the filter light, so that when that signal increases, then I'll tell the PLC to increase the, spe uh, the speed of the big fan VFD. Does that answer, gotcha. your, answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense. It, it sounds like it's going to be a PID loop for that, uh, for that fan, pretty much. I don't think you'll need that. It's going to be pretty huh? proportional. Yeah, it, everything gotcha. in process control often stuff is so slow that it you just re, kind of react react directly to it. We could get into PID, but I don't think he's going to need it. Um, so many yeah, I'll, times, yeah. I'll probably have uh, at the most maybe five uh, speed levels that I'll have for the VFD, and uh, you know it theoretically. Um, it shouldn't be changing the speed of the fan more than once or twice a week because um, these filters should should stay pretty consistently clean. Um, and it's more of a long term trend that I'd be dealing with. Makes sense. Thank you. Hey, this is Phil. Um, I've got a quick question. Um, your last answer kind of leads into that with the pressure differentials. Um, is, is there a way that you monitor when to replace the filters or is that just a, a time-based task that, you know, every six months replace the filters regardless of whether they're clean or not? And then the next question is how expensive are the filters? I'd imagine filters for different applications cost different amounts. Yeah, sure. Um, so those cartridge filters, uh, answering your last question first, um, those cartridge filters can use different kinds of media. Um, so if you're dealing with an oily uh, situation or, or metallic dust, or if it needs to be food safe, they can range in price on the low end, um, 150 bucks for a filter. Um, and for very specialized filters, you could spend three or $400. Um, in this particular unit, uh, it's a PFB 80, uh, the 80 denoting that it has 80 filters. So changing out the filters is an expensive endeavor. Um, so, you know, prolonging the life with that pulsing and also uh, controlling the fan can save the customer a lot of money. Um, in a simple application, we, we typically recommend that they change the filters. Uh, it, depending on the application, every one to two years, um, that being said, I, and not to toot my own horn or our company's own horn, but our design, uh, we have put in systems before, uh, and you guys know what plant maintenance is like. We put in systems before and the filters had not been changed for seven or eight years and, and it still functions. Um, you know, they're obviously not working nearly as well. Uh, but when we do have a system like this, uh, and, and on any system, we even have just a basic physical uh, differential pressure sensor. Um, when it gets to a certain level of static pressure, uh, or not static pressure, I'm sorry, pressure difference between the, the filters, chambers, uh, we recommend, you know, hey, if it hits nine, uh, nine or 10 inches of pressure, change your filters out. If you're staying at that level consistently, even after pulsing, um, the advantage with this is uh, I can log my pressure uh, differential over time and see that long-term trend. And if I go into the plant and it's showing, you know, hey, nine, 10 inches of difference, we can say, all right, well, let's, let's take the filters out. Let's take an air hose, let's blow them off, uh, put them back in and see what that looks like. Um, and maybe we don't have to replace them. Uh, 
So there's not a great answer to that question. Um, sometimes the dust can be entrained in the filter, and this is where the pulsing is critical. If the pulsing doesn't happen, um, that dust just keeps building onto the filter, and the longer this fan sucks that dust in, um, sometimes it can get stuck into the media and it won't ever pulse, and you can blind the filters pretty easily. Uh, and then in those cases, you do, you're, you've just, uh, by not checking your equipment and making sure it's pulsing, uh, you've just spent a few thousand dollars. Well, great, yeah, that answers my question. <laughs> we also talked about data collection, and, and just today, um, uh, Lucas was asking me about uh, the data collection capability of the wine views. And then this ties in with Vlad's question about what kind of HMI were you using. Um, I have been using uh, these wine view. They're actually wine tech HMIs. You would buy them from there. It's an Austrian company, but China has a basically a knockoff called wine view. And when I go down to Miami and do my work, that guy has spec'd wine. He's replaced all of his panel view pluses with wine views. The software is free. Uh, it does data collection. It has beautiful graphics. And these seven inch touchscreens are less than $200, which is mind blowing. Uh, you know, the cheapest touchscreens I know of in the US are Automation Directs, and they're $700. And, and these wine views are about 200 bucks. And, you know, if one goes bad, you just replace it, right? Uh, and I got a bunch of them here, and I've never had any go bad. We use 10 inch and 12 inch touchscreens down in Miami. The graphics are great, never had any, uh, any problems with them. What I don't know, and, and I'm gonna be able to do some research on this because I'm going to Miami in a week, uh, is how does the data collection on the uh, HMI, right? There's probably some kind of a card. It's gonna be a, a SD RAM card or flash card or something. I'm not really sure what it has and Lucas may know that. But, uh, you know, what do they use to log that in? Or are you going to have to connect a, a computer or something with some kind of software to the system? But um, the PLC itself, of course, will store data. Uh, that's a lot of my background is teaching PLC programming and how to archive that stuff. Um, in, in his case, now, this is a Micrologix 1400, which means you can't build UDTs. Uh, so if you have very many different kinds of data, uh, you have to package that in you know integer registers or floating point registers and you may want to create extra registers and just log them there and then you can always archive that and go back with your laptop and pull that stuff out if you're doing a, you know every hour or every day or whatever but yeah this is so this is a picture of his uh touch screen nice looking uh graphics is that the and that's the actual screen so uh um, yeah i I just ran over to it real quick to take a picture. Um, this, you know, I to come back to this whole thing. It, it's been a, a really big undertaking, uh, bigger than I initially expected because when you do a system, there's so many individual components besides the, the PLC programming. And I guess this kind of goes to your mastering the machine concept that you've got to think about how does the HMI interface and uh, what is the customer going to see and how is it, user friendly. Um, so I, this is a picture I just snapped uh, from my uh, HMI uh, laying out what do I need to show the customer. And so you can see there I've got my differential pressure um, and, uh, you know, showing these various mechanical components and, um, you know, figuring out exactly how to do it. But I, the, the Easy Builder Pro software, which is the free software for the Wine Tech or WineView HMIs is very uh, easy to use. And I've been really impressed. It comes with lots of custom assets. Um, and it's it's super easy to connect uh, you know, pretty much any function. Um, the things I'm having trouble with are some of the more complicated, I guess, the data logging and uh, dealing with some of these analog scaled inputs. But um, I've been pretty pleased with the software. It also emulates, which uh, is one on the, in the Automation Academy. Uh, I have a free download of that software, and it will connect to the emulatable uh, RS, RS Logix 500, which I also have a copy of that on there. And you can connect the two of them together, emulate your PLC and emulate your uh, HMI, and you don't even need a PLC. So that's a neat tool from a training standpoint, right? I'd look for something like that for a long time. 
Uh, they have drivers for everything. Um, and as I mentioned, I think Lucas, you were overtaking a picture when I did it, but since I'm headed to Miami, I'm pretty sure that they've done some data logging uh, on those. So I'll be able to give you a little bit of feedback. They're doing a, um, I think a lot of the compressors in their, in their compressor room, they're, they're grabbing data from that. And I think writing it to a card. Do you know if that has a card on it? That little HMI? Um, I, I was looking at it. Uh, I couldn't see anything, but it does have a USB port and it has the option for uh, storing data on a USB drive uh, that you can plug in the back. Oh yeah, I'm looking at it right now and I see, uh, I see two USB ports. I see, uh, looks like an extra serial port and I think maybe it does Modbus, I'm not really sure. So there's a variety of ways you can do that when, when people get into data uh, archiving. It's, a, it's got its own art to it, but, uh, but we'll work it out. Uh, you know, I'm curious, sorry to interrupt. I'm curious about the data application. Are you trying to collect something from the customers to improve the, the process or is it more for them to kind of maintain it a little bit better? What's the, I guess, the use case ultimately for this data? Uh, it's a little bit of both actually. Um, so uh, going back to the whole thing about the filters lifespan, um, you know, if I can see longer term trends and how the differential pressure is increasing or decreasing, uh, that can help with diagnosing issues. Um, I'm also looking to, to store data. I'd like to be able to try and ultimately use uh, a year or two's worth of data um, to see what the long term performance trends are. Um, and uh, this customer has actually agreed to uh, allow me online uh, offsite access to the equipment and to the machine. And so uh, my hope is that, you know, I can use this as a, a field study. There are a couple of small things that we've adjusted on this particular project that uh, minor changes that we think will improve the system. Uh, and so it'd be great to see, hey, you know, this this actually plays out because it, it can be it can be hard sometimes to collect real data on equipment out in the field because customers don't want you showing up to their plant every month to, you know, <laughs> rummage around and see how things are working. Yeah, and we that's actually, pretty cool. Thanks. You, we actually do this uh, down in Miami too. Uh, you can because you can simulate these. You can bring it up on your own laptop. And, and have your own screens if you want to and look in all the registers of the PLC. And depending on how much storage you have, right, you can archive data right there. I'm, I'm kind of a big fan of doing that, even if people have a SCADA system and they're logging it to a SQL database or whatever. Uh, I think in Miami, I keep a month in a lot of the PLCs, a month's worth of data, and there's a lot of it, right? Control Logics will store a whole lot of data. Um, and the reason is uh, they use ignition down there extensively and their ignition servers will go down and they may be down for a day or two, uh, you know, depending on what's going on with the computers. They, it's a big plant with a lot going on. And, and he's, he, this guy down there has developed all his own ignition stuff. Um, now, I think there's some inelution stuff and, and some inexpensive SCADA software that you can get. Uh, that somebody, you know, like, like if Lucas wanted to recommend it to the customer and put a little package there and then pick up the files from the customer, I think there's some things you could do that are a lot less expensive than Ignition or, you know, Factory Talk View or <laughs> some of those uh, Wonderware, which is now called Aviva, I think, uh, you know, uh, some of those packages are very expensive and probably way overkill for something like this. So. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about uh, the China part. Um, it, it's just quite a coincidence that we're all in the middle of the pandemic here and that, you know, you were in Wuhan when the first, uh, I, what, what time frame were you in Wuhan last year or that year? Well, I, so I actually, uh, I haven't been in China since uh, July of 2020. Um, but my dad, uh, he actually went over, uh, no, sorry, not July 2020, July 2019. Um, my dad, though, uh, because we have a plant over there, he went over in January, uh, January 3rd or 4th last year. Um, and at that point, there were just some very small, uh, you know, mumblings about this strange virus in Wuhan. 
And uh, as as you guys well know, um, they're often uh, SARS or uh, coronavirus, not necessarily COVID-19, uh, developments in Asia. And so it's, it's not uncommon to hear about a certain variant. Um, but he went over and uh, they have the Chinese New Year uh, on based on the lunar calendar. And um, we kind of shut down the factory and everybody went back home to their hometowns. And uh, not long after that, uh, the Chinese government sort of realized what a big problem this was uh, and locked the city down. Um, and so dad was stuck in Wuhan and, and they actually physically placed boulders and uh, mounds of sand on all the interstates coming in and out of the city. And uh, it was not martial law, but it was very strictly enforced. You'd be fined the equivalent of about a thousand US dollars if you were outside your apartment. And uh, so dad had um, government people in uh, hazmat suits delivering groceries to the door. And he was ultimately was stuck in his apartment uh, for about 69 days. And uh, it was a struggle for him to be able to get out of the country, but that's, uh, that's just what happened. Um, and in retrospect, looking back at it, uh, it's crazy that I did not think about what was going on over there and consider, uh, it's probably going to get that bad over here. Um, of course now in China, um, it is largely back to business as usual. Uh, they're, they've had very aggressive uh, tactics and and addressing flare ups, um, and so when there's even a few cases in a city, they shut everything down. Um, and you know you, we can debate as to the merits of uh, that sort of a strong, heavy-handed government approach, but um, they've been back to business as usual for the better part of about six months now. Um, and so we our plants back online. We're we've got several jobs going on over there, but. Um, not sure yet exactly when dad's going to be able to return. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Is he over there right now or is he here? He's, he's here in the States um, and has been since he was able to come back in July, August of last year. Okay. Wow. And you spent quite a bit of time over there, right? Yeah. I, so um, from 2014 to 2018, I was there uh, about nine, 10 months out of the year. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are a lot of interesting things that I could talk about. Uh, of course, everything over there is Siemens. Um, and so when we have had more complex systems like this and coming back to the reason why I wanted to undertake this project, um, we would outsource it and I would see the HMIs and they were very hard to read, weren't very intuitive. Um, depending on the availability of the contractor or who we had putting the system together, we would get wildly different uh, results. And uh, so, you know, my goal with this, not only doing the system for this one customer was, if I can create a baseline product, uh, whether it's on a Siemens or whatever, I can then give this to our team in China and say, okay, from now on, whoever we use as an electrical contractor this is the base. Uh, whatever they do needs to look like this and work this way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you would not believe some of the crazy installations I've seen with wiring and um, people using water hoses as conduit. Uh, I mean, uh, China is still very much the Wild West in terms of industrial safety, uh, occupational health and safety. And, uh, you know, uh, in a small village, small being, you know, uh, few, few tens of thousands of people, but in a small village in uh, rural uh, Hubei province, um, you know, these guys are going to do whatever they, they need to do to get the equipment up and running. And then we'll, we'll worry about the health and safety when somebody gets hurt. Uh, and so that, that can be a real challenge sometimes. Yeah, even first world places, and I'm not sure where the line is for first world, but uh, in Korea, I, I did some work out there and there were guys climbing on the walls two, three stories high in the plant, holding on to conduit and shimmying along the wall. And, and you know, that's a, it's a very high tech country, but when you see the people pulling wire and things up, up on those things, yeah, I mean, if somebody lets go, that's flat, you know, there's no tie offs, there were no scaffolding. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty incredible. 
So yeah, this is this has been great. Um, it, it seems like every time I do one of these, I we, we get into a different kind of technology and we talk about different uh, different things. And this has been good because again, uh, Lucas is is kind of taking this from scratch and not knowing the electrical and control side at all. And he's done all this since I'd say January, uh, which is pretty incredible. Um, and, and of course, I guess you're you're also getting your law degree, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm a law student, uh, and I've, I've been still working part-time with the family business. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've, I've had to balance my time since I've been back in school. But um, I told Frank, you know, the at the end goal is I put the system in and everything works out well. And then I can casually mention to the customer, yeah, I'm actually in school and just did this part-time. But uh, that's a wait until everything's working really well uh, before I could ever drop that and make the customer feel good. Yeah, neat stuff. Well, uh, we managed to fill up our, our hour well, and I learned a bunch, and uh, hopefully the other folks did here too. Looked like we had a max of only about six people on here, but uh, a bunch of people tune into this on, on uh, you know, uh, I, I posted on YouTube and I was kind of up in the air as to whether I, especially when there's good information in here, whether I want to just give this stuff away and stick it on YouTube all the time. But I think I'm going to keep doing that. Um, it's, I guess it's an advertising thing or whatever, as much as anything. Sometimes we get into some good technical stuff. Um, like here, I mean, I learned more about uh, dust collection systems than I would have ever known by looking at it online or anything, right? Uh, pretty neat stuff. I guess I've seen them in the plants, you know, I, 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 I know they're there, but I've never, certainly never looked inside of one or, you know, I'm usually working on the kind of the moving machinery, but there's a lot to them. Yeah. We just... um, Frank, to that end, I'll, I'll say this for the, the folks who are still around or anybody who listens to this after the fact, I, I'm perfectly happy to, to talk to anybody who might have additional questions about um, what I'm doing, um, or who have questions about our equipment, uh, dust collection in general. It's a, it's a pretty specialized area, but, um, I'd be happy to, to speak to anybody who had additional questions. Cool. Um, thank you, Frank and Lucas. Really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and pop up a screen here. I think it has, there you go. Lucas is on there and then we will wrap it up here. And let's see if this works. There we go. So yeah, this is the kind of the final slide that I pop up here. Um, again, we do these every two weeks. Uh, and I do have a website uh, called uh, the Automation Academy. It can be found at the address that you see on the screen. And the next webinar, again, it's open to everybody. Uh, Lucas is actually a member at the Automation Academy, there are a whole lot of downloadable resources there. So he's been able to, and sometimes people ask me to go find another downloadable resource and I'll go find one. So there's things like just basic electrical, PLC classes, uh, and I'm, I'm just now finishing up a very good write-up on machine vision. Uh, I always wanted to create a generic one that was not all by Cognex or all by Keyence or whatever. So I I did a very detailed uh, what is machine vision from a very basic level and then kind of got into some, you know, what are all the tools and trying to keep it generic. Uh, I go back to the DVT days, so may do one of those, um, uh, uh, you know, machine vision type webinar at some point. Uh, but anyway, the next uh, webinar, I'll be back at ABD, which we did one in, uh, I want to say November or beginning of December. And the owner of the plant down there is a guy named Juan Pablo Garbine. And uh, he is an incredible ignition programmer. I do his pretty screens. I like doing pretty HMI and SCADA screens, but he does all the background stuff. And he's built, uh, some of you guys may have seen this unified namespace going out. You know, accidentally, he and I, over the last five years, have built that uh, with ignition. It is a unified namespace accidentally. So you know, we just had one giant SQL server database that contains everything for everything from human resources to, um, to shipping and receiving to machine data to everything. And we've been working on this thing, like I said, continuously. So I've learned a lot from him, but that's what we'll be doing on March 19th, which is two more weeks. 
And uh, of course, I post these also in the Automation Academy. I always post the webinars and uh, trying to kind of build some membership there. It's becoming a systems integration uh, place more than a PLC place. Um, I'd love to partner with people like Vlad or something if we could figure out a way to do it and, and somehow put his PLC stuff on there because I don't want to create anymore. I love high tech PLC stuff. I do not like the basics. I don't, I don't, you know, timers and counters, and especially I'm working on four different brands. And so I do these odyssey things where I just get in there and start a program and then start simulating a bunch of stuff and crazy stuff. And I, I don't, it takes so long to make videos. Uh, any words on that, Vlad? You, you're, you've created videos now for years, I know. Solus PLC. I mean, <laughs> it's for sure a struggle for me as well. You know what I mean? Like once you've somewhat exhausted a lot of that uh, content and trying to like, add to it becomes really tedious and as you've uh, you've mentioned just going through the video i guess that's not my preferred time spent for sure you know video editing and then going through like every second of that video making sure that it looks nice um but um as you said i think it just takes a lot of time to kind of build up to that library and uh, i mean we'll talk offline a little bit more on how we can collaborate but i, I really like the systems integration aspect i think there's very little of that uh, content online and as you know even i'm trying to get into that a little bit more and so i i think that's extremely valuable and that's knowledge that cannot just be acquired in like a very basic classroom you have many many years of experience and i think that's much more valuable than someone just that goes like by the book you know what i mean like you can really share like the depth of your knowledge with uh, with the community and i think th there's just nothing like it right now and there's not enough time to do everything. That's That's been my, part of my problem. So I created a course, it's a catch-all there called Mastering the Machine, just like this thing. And I've, I've only got one episode on it. It has a lot to do with uh, how machines are evaluated, where the preliminary stuff, right? How do you uh, do a concept on a new machine that you don't know how it's gonna work until you, right? Until you uh, prototype it or you, you design it. So some people have asked for information on that. The next one's actually going to be on the quoting process. How do you price all the stuff? How do you um, how do you mitigate risk? And we've had a couple webinars on that with uh, Doug Allward. He's an applications engineer I used to work with. Uh, so it's going to evolve, and and we'll just see where it ends up. But uh, it's been a lot of fun, guys. Uh, this is pretty much it. As I said, I stick these on uh, YouTube and I put them on my uh, on my website. And uh, Lucas. I'm sure we'll be talking uh, and Vlad. Yeah, both of us. Uh, Lucas is Lucas is at the tail end. You know, the the real reward is power up, right? You get it all built and you apply power to it and you make it go. Uh, I don't know if you're going to make it go in your shop with a hundred horsepower drive. <laughs> no, I, I I might wait for the the field install for that one, but I, I'm very much looking forward to it. Yeah, as long yeah. as there's no smoke, that's a that's a big win already at the start. Right? <laughs> but I was happy to see he has his HMI talking to his PLC, and he's got. I'm sure you got lights going on and off and all that kind of stuff. So that's the first step, man. And yeah. All right, guys, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, we'll see you all on the next one. <laughs> Thank you again. Take care, Thank you, everybody. All right.